So welcome to the BioExcel webinar number 52. Today, as a presenter, we have Paul Bauer and Berkes from the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden. And they will speak about what is new in Gromax 2021. So something about the today presenter. Paul is a Gromax Developer Manager. He, he finished his PhD in 2017 at the University of Uppsala on computational enzymology with Lynn Kamerlin. Then he decided to move to Stockholm, where he worked as a scientific programmer and researcher in the group of Eric Lindahl in the Institute of Technology, KTH. And he started to work on Gromax. Then in 2019, he became development manager of Gromax. Berg S. is professor of theoretical physics at the Royal Institute of Technology. He, he designed a lot of algorithms for Gromax simulation package in the last two decades. His current research focus is advanced sampling methods, aggregation of molecules, and uh, wetting of surface uh, at a molecular scale. And they will tell us what is new in Gromax 20. 21. So welcome everyone in this afternoon and as Alessandra said I'm just gonna give you to give a, talk, a quick overview of what kind of new features we had in uh, Gromax 2021 that we just released a few weeks ago and also some things that we're currently working on and interesting development to come. Dirk is going to focus his part of the webinar on uh, two of the new features where he helped to properly implement them. And as he is the expert in that field, he will speak about them later. Uh, so what, what is Gromax for? Well, it's the one simulations. And usually we think about simulations, biomolecular simulations. But it can also be used to simulate basically any system that you can describe using the algorithms we have implemented. So here you see a nice membrane system that is being simulated, but you can simulate everything from carbon nanotubes to macromolecular assemblies. Yeah. The good thing is, uh, the thing we want to achieve with Gromax is that you can just run a simulation of something interesting, like this um, uh, transmembrane receptor in a large box with multiple uh, ligand molecules and uh, surrounding molecules not having to worry much about how efficient the simulation is because we should take care of this and without having to, to have too much hassle in setting up simulations, trying different algorithms or um, playing around with system settings until you get things right. All the things that we have in Gromax is of course hopefully documented in our manual and I we we'll always ask people to please read the manual first and release notes to know what is are the new features. You will find all the information there always. And you can also find information about the implemented algorithms, about some limitations that we know about, and things that we are not working any longer on or that we know that are not working at the moment. You also will always see um, what kind of bugs we have fixed in the recent patch releases or also major releases. There are also previous webinars that showed the uh, capabilities of the previous Gromax releases. I just have the links here to the uh, two recent ones. And if you're interested to see what changed in the, between those versions, I welcome you to check those. I think they're also quite interesting to listen to. Now we have a quite strict release cycle for Gromax that we try to have one release every year. And we also strict that we have this release at the beginning of the year. Here, we tried first to have the releases at the last of December or first of January, but that didn't really work out. So we had this release a bit more sedate pace in February. And we have plans of a patch releases that will take care of the few bugs that we have already investigated. During autumn, we will switch our main development to the 2022 branch and hopefully release a number of betas, a release candidate to prepare for the 2022 release in early, early, uh, early next year. Just a final note for the 2020 branch, we're just expecting to have maybe one more patch release coming up now in 
February and maybe a second one in April if we find some bugs that are simulation breaking or affect the physics in a bad way. But this branch is now officially only supported for things that are of major concern to us and we want to focus our main efforts on the 2021 branch and our developments for the future. Now, I actually didn't change this slide from last year, but it just shows that Gomex has quite a high input impact and I I think I should uh, change it before we have another release webinar or something. Because we have also a few more publications that mention Gromax and that show what you can use it for in the end. Now, not to what we're actually doing. Gromax is not just developed as something that we do at KPH with a few programmers, but it's part of a larger collaboration with multiple projects, multiple external groups. The development through BioExcel is one large part, but we also have several co-design projects where we work with hardware vendors to make sure that we have proper support for new hardware before hardware is hopefully released, and also proper support and proper uh, performance on new hardware systems. And we work with other groups to implement new features at the same time. Now for the main part, what well, are actually for? There are a few new features and those is, this list is just taken directly from the release notes. So if you want to go there, you can read the same thing there. But the main, few, main things that we have developed now are mentioned here, and we are gonna talk over them quickly now over the course of this webinar. And I think we'll start with the multiple time stepping. And for this, I will give the word to Burke who helped implement this and is the expert there. Okay, thanks, Paul. So, um, yeah, I have the honor to introduce the first two new features of uh, Gromax 2021. So, um, the first major one is m multiple time stepping or multiple time step integrator to be more precise. So, we haven't prioritized it in the past because we always were using um, virtual sites to replace hydrogen masses to use a time step of four femtoseconds, but this is getting to the limits. So, we now finally also uh, looked into multiple time stepping that many other codes already have. Um, so I'll show how it works, um, well, how, the, how it fundamentally works and then show how, how you can use it in Gromax 2021. So the, the, the main goal here is to improve performance by calculating some parts or some part of the forces less frequently. Um, and the scheme we use is the standard R RESPA reversible and symplectic integrator. Um, so the idea is that you split the potential in the fast and slow varying parts, which can either be because the, some atoms move faster or slower, or because uh, the forces themselves actually vary less with the motions of the atoms because the, the potential is quite smooth. Um, so if this is currently implemented only for the leapfrog integrator in Gromax, which is extremely simple scheme. So you only change the velocity integration, not the force integration. Um, so at, Every n steps where n you can choose, you integrate both the fast and the slow forces. So you need to compute both as you would normally do. Um, and then you simply add in into the integration, the slow force n times. So the slow force gets, gets added multiple times or effectively has a larger time step. So you can also write n times dt here. Um, every other step, you only integrate the fast force. So this is for a two level scheme where you just decompose one slow and one fast. You could have more, which is not implemented in the current release. Um, so this is extremely simple and it's shown here in the right in this in this diagram where you have the in blue the slow force and in red the fast forces. So the fast forces are added every step as normally to integrate the, the velocities which then go into the integration of the, of the coordinates. Um, but the slow forces you simply add up twice in this example with n is two where this factor or this yeah, this you do it every two steps you compute the slow force so you simply add them in twice. Um, so you move, uh, you impulse the, the slow forces. So actually it's extremely simple if you look at this, but this has been well thought out, uh, not by, by, by me or by us, but uh, by uh, others uh, a long time ago now. Um, so the only comp slightly complicating part here is that the constraint variable is more complicated because the constraints forces are inferred from the displacements, which now depend on, on um, in this way on, on forces with different prefactors. So one has to do some, some tricks there, but that's correctly implemented. 
So this is the basics, uh, the basis here, and then one can choose which forces are slow and which are fast to make different trade-offs of performance versus accuracy. Uh, so you should choose the slow force as well, such that you don't introduce a lot of integration error by integrating less often. Okay, so how this is done in, in practice is um, through some MDP options. So by default, multiple time stepping is turned off, but you can turn it on by setting MTS as yes, and then the other options listed here are default. So we default, we have two levels, which is only the number of supported currently. We might add more in the future. Um, then the default setting currently for the what forces are treated for uh, in updated less often, it's only long range non-bonded, which uh, means PME grid forces, which is usually PME for Coulomb, but could also be for, for Leonard Jones if you use PME for Leonard Jones as well. And the default factor is two, which is the usual kind of um, setup that other codes also use where you update uh, the PME grid forces every four femtoseconds instead of two. Um, so what this standard setup gives, it gives small to moderate performance gain in most cases, but it's 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 free, so to say, because it doesn't cost you accuracy in most cases to integrate the PME grid less often. Um, it can give higher performance gain at high parallelization because um, there the PME grid calculation can be well, it 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 will dominate the 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 um, communication cost. So there the gains can be much higher. So that's one of the main areas. Uh, targeted here it can also one other example it can also be used for compulsed forces which can also be expensive especially in, in parallel simulations where you have to co communicate a lot so there if your if your pool forces don't fluctuate very oh sorry don't fluctuate very quickly then that's also an option um, so here i can also mention that my original idea here was to replace the the the, the large time step with hydrogens replaced by virtual sites with this scheme since the the hydrogen uh, the virtual sites hydrogen scheme doesn't work so well anymore, especially on GPUs. So one can add more, more forces to this, to this um, less, to the slow force group, less frequently updated. So there, my idea was to do long range non-bonded, non-bonded pairs and dihedrals. But unfortunately, it turns out that some hydrogens get unstable every hundred nanoseconds or a few hundred. So that's not very frequent, but happens now and then. So that wasn't feasible. So that's certainly not the default. So I'm still looking into this uh, and hopefully I'll get back with more information at some point here. Uh, a small, slightly smaller time step could actually work here. Okay, then uh, the a final note on multiple time stepping is things that we might in, uh, extend support for in, in the next release or later. So one um, issue currently is that it's not support. So com update on a GPU is not supported combined with multiple time stepping. So this could lead to some performance loss because you, the update uh, needs to be done on the CPU in that case or the integration and combining forces. Um, so that we would like to improve because especially for GPU heavy machines here, you could have a nice gain of not having to do PME every step. Uh, we'd like support for the stochastic dynamics integrator, especially for free energy calculations. Um, support maybe for more special forces to decompose and maybe have more than two MTS levels. Although in practice, it's often not so useful because more force fields have been anyhow parameterized with constraints on the hydrogen. So you don't want the time step, which is, well, you want the time step is anyhow two, two femtoseconds and there's not much more gain to be had. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about multiple time stepping. So then there's another new feature, which is free energy calculations with the accelerated waste histogram method. So the accelerated weight histogram method has been part of Gromax for some time. That has been developed by a PhD student working with, with me, but that was only, um, you could only use it for pool, center of mass pooling coordinates. So now we've added extension there. Oh, I should have mentioned uh, uh, the name of uh, uh, Magnus Lundborg on this, on this slide, who has done most of the work here. Um, he has extended this, um, together with me to, to the lambda coupling parameter. So how you, let me first explain how you would normally do free energy calculations, which some of you might be familiar with. So to interpolate between two states A and B, so it could be a molecule solvated and one in vacuum, or it could be a, a, mut, a mutation in a protein where the A is the wild type uh, protein and B is, has a one side chain mutated, for instance, you would add a coupling parameter to Hamiltonian uh, called lambda, and then you run many simulations at each at a different lambda value to compute the derivative with the uh, of the Hamiltonian with respect to lambda, or nowadays you would 
compute differences in the Hamiltonian with respect to lambda, I use balanced acceptance ratio. Um, so now that AWH can handle this, what, what you can, what it can do is it can move lambda uh, dynamically in one simulation and from that get a free energy. So the setup is actually really simple. So you need to set AWH as yes. You need to set AWH one dim one coordinate provider pep lambda. So you set, you tell it to use, to act on lambda. And the only parameter you need to set is a diffusion coefficient, which tells roughly how fast the system moves along lambda. And it seems like one 0 0.01, one over picosecond is reasonably okay in most cases. Um, so then you get the free energy out of a single simulation. So you run one simulation, lambda moves and uh, in the energy file with the normal AWH tool, you can extract the free energy you get out of this. So this is really convenient and also turns out to be quite efficient. So as efficient as the Bennett acceptance ratio method, or maybe slightly more efficient in some cases. We're working on a manuscript here to, to show this. Um, another advantage now is that you can parallelize this with multiple walkers using mdrun multi dir So you can uh, have many independent or semi-independent simulations contribute to the same uh, free energy build difference being built up. So in that way you can get your result faster and use many simulations and more hardware to get your answer quicker. Um, this will be explained in more detail in the near future in a BioXL webinar on AWH plus uh, free energy calculations, which will be announced soon. Um, so with this, I would like to give the word back to Paul. Yes, thank you both. Yeah, I would just go on directly with the other main new features that we have. And I think one of the most important ones is that we implemented a new type of pressure code coupling algorithm that has been uh, contributed to us by uh, Giovanni Bussi and his group in a really well executed external collaboration. We uh, were able to implement a stochastic cell rescaling algorithm that is a pressure coupling algo pressure coupling method that can be used both for the equilibration and the uh, production uh, parts of the calculation. Just if you're interested in it, I would recommend that you check out the paper that is mentioned here, and that just show that here what is basically what you can do with it. You no longer have to switch between balance and the equilibration part of the simulation, and then whatever other algorithm you've been using before for the production part making it easier to use in the end and also reducing the um, amount of errors we hope that people that either use the wrong pressure coupling method to equilibration or production just because they forgot to change the MDP field for it. Yeah. Uh, going on. Another main thing that we were able to add was experimental support for SQL as um, method to offload uh, calculations to accelerator devices. I have to say this is really experimental still and in the default 2021 release, you're not gonna see much of it because we only have added some uh, backend, back, backend uh, stuff for it and not something that the user is in the front end. But for people that are happy to experiment with this new, in the future we have actually a development branch that tracks the 2021 release and includes all the SQL features we have added for Subconnor. And you can find the link here for, the, find the link on the slide. And also just if you go to manualbomax.org, you'll find a link and a short explanation what this branch is for. We want to explore SQL further because we think it's gonna be an interesting approach for offloading if it manages to target different kinds of accelerator architectures. And we also hope that we can use it in the future to provide support for AMD GPUs that is currently done with OpenCL. We want to see if we can use HIPSQL and, and for this instead, instead of having to add another GPU port that is vendor specific by using the HIP standard. Yeah. Then uh, something that is a main feature and it's hopefully gonna make people happy that do free energy calculations where they put your charges. And that is that you can now offload PME calculations to GPUs if you do free energy calculations with charge perturbations. This means that for simulations that we're currently only able to use the GPU for number of calculations and then have to do 
in in the GPU that can be quite slow because you have to calculate multiple grids for charge perturbation, you should expect a major performance gain from this. This has also been contributed mainly by work from uh, Magnus, so I want to talk with you again. And we hope that will be uh, of major impact for people that do the free energy kind of, kind of approaches. One last uh, thing when it comes to hardware support, that is that we have extended our support for the ARM architecture by adding uh, SVE scalable vector extension support. This has again been contributed through external collaborations from uh, RSIT and JEPA. And the only thing that you need for this is basically a compatible type compiler and tool chain that you should be able to get if you are interested in building and running on ARM. And for now, you only get the ability to choose the uh, SVE vector size at configure time of limits, but you can configure it for any value that is uh, fitting for your ARM device. We have been in talk with the people from uh, RSIT and the uh, contributor that helped us implement this in changing this to maybe have one time support for the different uh, vector sizes, but that is still something we're discussing and not fixed yet. And just as a final thing is that you now have a full, fully functioned uh, nonlinear interaction API and also listed forces in interaction API with MVLOOP, an external project in collaboration with Trace. This ships now with GORMAX 2021 and you can use it to try uh, program mini apps for test out, for testing algorithms. You can try our new thing, new ways to set up to topologies and then interaction types. And we hope that we can extend the use of this in Gormax by adapting our own topology formats to it and getting away from the legacy input processing and also simulation setup that can be hopefully sim simplified with this kind of feature, fully featured API. Good. Enough with new features. Now about things that we removed. And uh, it's a good thing that we haven't removed anything new yet. For this year, last year, we removed quite a lot because the groups game got finally removed after, after being deprecated for years. So for now, there has been nothing new completely removed from Gromax, but there are still a few features that are not working because we haven't added the support for them yet. And this is mainly membrane advantage embedding that we hope to get back at some point. And we are sorry, even though we promised that we would try to get it implemented again, we haven't been able to add the use supply tables for the non wanted interactions yet. This is work in progress, and I give you a promise that it's going to be in 2022, come hello or high water, and that you will finally be able to supply your own interaction formats again for this. There are a few new requirements for this version. We have been a bit aggressive when it comes to the C++ um, standard that we require, that we now require C++ 17 after requiring C++ 14 last year. This is mainly because it makes our life much, much easier when it comes to development and making sure that the code actually works. We still require only uh, CUDA 9 that is C++ 14 compatible. But we are thinking about bumping this requirement for the next release, again, to make our life easier and making it possible for us to support the newest kinds of features. Another thing is that you need a slightly more modern CMAC now to run, to configure and compile Chromax. It's not that new, and you should get this version with any recent operation system in, installed that I can think about. There are a few things that we have deprecated for the next release, and I think some of them may be a bit contentious. One of them is that we really think that the default name setting for output files will be removed or should be removed because it's providing nothing but hassle for us and makes it very difficult to robustly implement restarting and file handling on a very on a low level. So we think that we will have to remove it and maybe provide different kinds of options for it. Now I think that has been officially deprecated, but um, will not be removed probably yet is OpenCL. We hope that we can uh, provide support for devices that are currently targeted by OpenCL using the 
Zika standard and something like a cycle, but as long as OpenCL is needed to run formats on those devices, it's the same. But the moment we can remove it, we will remove it because it's very difficult to maintain again fast. And it's using a different coding standard that makes it difficult to use modern uh, C++ features for this kind of GPU code. We also removed some uh, SIMD architecture support for things that are no longer um, relevant in the HPC space. That's not really of much interest, except if you um, run on some one of the systems. The thing is, if Gromax will still run on it, but they use the plain SIMD kernels instead of accelerated kernels. Another thing that will go away with the next version is the MD1 only build because it has done its it's done its job. It's not on the because you can run everything through through the GMAX wrapper binary, and it's you don't really need a separate MD1 binary now. Do you think? We're gonna remove HWLock because uh, API version one because we want to take full advantage of the features that are available with the API version two, and it should have widespread option now. Some other things is probably not of much uh, interest. The main thing I think is the constant acceleration MD that has been broken forever and sh should probably not be used because we can't really say if it's working or not. Like we got a user report today that says that it's working, but I don't really think we can put any effort in making sure this, that it works again. Yeah. As I said before, we have a few code design projects that I just want to plug here again. This is mainly with NVIDIA, trying to uh, get the um, support for new CUDA devices in. We are working together with Intel and maybe soon AMD to get support for in Intel GPUs and for AMD GPUs. And of course, we're working together with people that are interested in uh, getting Gromax accelerated on ARM chips. Good. Uh, we're coming to the end of my slides here in both my webinar with some slides for the long-term plans that I should, probably should have updated because we have multiple time setting, stepping support now, but we are not able yet to replace completely virtual sites with it. So I hope we can improve ourselves a bit more and get this completely replaced. We are still working on improving support for the Python and the C++ API to make it easier to use Chromex as a library. And we now provide actually a set of um, Gromax containers, so you can run Gromax directly through Docker or Singularity if you're interested in this. And we updated our CI testing, so you can run the same things we have in CI if you want to make sure that things actually work. A few things that are not here on the list, like support for newer methods like constant pH, pH calculations, but I am I think we should, we should just uh, stay tuned for our development and look for the uh, beta releases later this year. And if you're interested in following us, our development on GitLab, I just welcome you to have a look there. Good. This, the uh, development of Gromax is, of course, a uh, work of quite a few people that I'm not going to name here. I just want to plug again the development leads, Eric, Burke, Mark and David that started the project and have been uh, leading it for a long time. And the people I worked together with in Stockholm, Christian, Sillard, uh, I see Joe, Artem, and I forgot Andre, our new developer to put him under this, but yeah. That's it. I hope it was interesting webinar for you. And I think I will give back to Alessandra and Julian for the Q&A session. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul and Berg, for that very interesting talk. Um, some of those new features that you were talking about are definitely very interesting, and uh, I look forward to trying them. While still waiting for questions, uh, I'll take this opportunity to sneak in my quick question to Berg, uh, which is, have you done any performance testing on the uh, two time step method to see how much of a speed up you can get on some basic protein system. So how much faster do simulations go? Well, the, the problem here is it depends completely both on your system and the hardware you're running on. So um, in the worst case, you might actually get worse performance. 
um, because if you have, for instance, multiple devices, a CPU and a GPU, and, and one of them is fully busy and you remove work from the other one, then actually you won't gain anything, but there's a bit of overhead. So then you get a few, a few percent overhead. That would be the worst kind of case. And the best kind of case is, of course, where, where, where you're limited by, by PME, and then you don't need to do it every step, and, you, and then you can get a high gain. So that's in the, as I tried to say, in the, in a massively parallel case where you're always limited by, by PME. But even then, you might have separate PME ranks, for instance, which would run idle, and then the gain is only uh, the, 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 the wait time on that. Whereas if you would be running PME on, on the same ranks where you're doing other computation, then you can actually um, reduce the time on a rank, so in 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 best case, so I mean, let's see what's the best case. I guess the best case on a GPU where you would be spending maybe a, a third of the time or more or, or, or on PME. So if you can half that, you could gain a sixth of the time or maybe a bit more. Um, so that, uh, but in parallel, you could gain gain even more than that. So the gain is, um, I think, often not so high, but ten or twenty percent is is certainly possible. Uh, but it depends completely on both your system and the hardware you're running on. And it also affects, in that sense, the maybe the choice how you want to run the simulation as well. So it makes things even a bit more complex. We should automate that, by the way. That sounds. I mean, ten to twenty percent sounds brilliant on long simulations and large simulations, right? Yes, yes, and it's nearly free, so to say. Um, so yeah, yeah. So so, so if, if that applies to your to your yeah. to your case, then sure, do it. Yes. Uh, great, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, the next question we have is from Bert de Groot. All right, so yeah, thanks for the great work. Um, I was just wondering about the constant acceleration. Uh, what is exactly broken? Uh, we've uh, used it quite a bit and it seems to work as advertised. Uh, that's a surprise to us because we uh, also had reports that it's broken and that it's not working. So, there are some fields that are just not used by it that should be used, and some I think that it should some would be a force should be applied or an energy should be checked, and that's just not done anymore since 4.6, I think. Okay. Um, I mean, the functionality is not completely covered by the pool code, I think, so it, 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 um, it would be a pity if it would be removed. The thing is, we really we uh, have to, would need to check to actually uh, be sure that we can implement that it's implemented correctly and that those um, that the method works as it should uh, as it should. We have removed it now. Of course, we can revert the uh, remo the removal in the Git master branch. But uh, I would be interested to hear. How it's working for you? Because we have we have an issue for this, and be sure that it should it should not be working. Because where the thing that does the acceleration done, the, that does the acceleration is applied is no longer done correctly. Yeah, we can we can um, talk offline and share the the test that we did as well. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that uh, question and the answer. Uh, the next question we have is from, um, sorry, one moment, is from Victoria Hill. Uh, are there any situations where the multiple time, time steps may not be appropriate? Um, well, there are many, so, but that depends on how you set it up. So uh, the, the, the parameters I showed, if you only do PME every four femtoseconds, so if you would have a standard simulation setup and you only turn on the option with all the defaults set, you would only be doing PME every four femtoseconds, and I think that's quite standard that many people in the community use that use other code. So that should be un unproblematic. But you could, of course, choose different forces there. You could choose a, a larger, a larger long time step, so not a factor too larger than a normal time step, but much more, and then it quickly gets in inappropriate. So there's a quite small, small regime where it works. Like I already. Um, uh, found out quite late that, for instance, the scheme I wanted that that uh, that I had planned to use that that's not fully fully stable. So you need yeah quite long simulations of more than hundreds of nanoseconds to to, to see that hydrogens become unstable if you choose uh, if you choose also other terms um, other force terms as well uh, to update less frequently. So 
this is quite tricky. So, so I, 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 there's a lot of, of literature already out there, but uh, I think there's 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 space for for uh, more more investigation here to see what works and what doesn't. So I, I'm planning to write a, a manuscript on that, but that requires a bit more study to see what, which things might be appropriate to do and what's and if they don't give side effects. So usually usually it's things tend to cause instabilities and the simulation crashes. So I haven't seen any cases where I could get the simulation to run stable for a long time and get wrong results or wrong sampling. Um, it usually resulted in a crash. So that's that's the good the good part there. Probably if you would do PME and you would do that every like some people to try to do that every eight femtoseconds or so, I think then you actually would get incorrect results, which would not cause instability. So that's dangerous. Great, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, the next question we have is from uh, Karsten Kutzner. Yeah, uh, so sorry, I, I missed part of the, the earlier question, but so it might be related. So my question would actually be, if, if you do multiple time stepping and you would use, um, let's say you would compare a, a parallel simulation uh, to, to a simulation with four femtoseconds with, with virtual sites, and would you, would you get any performance benefit in parallel uh, than uh, with PME because you would update normally PME every four femtoseconds anyhow, or would you would you be able to do it less often? And, and, oh, so, and so, 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 the, so the, the performance gain, the, the, the scheme that would, would be nearly equivalent in performance or slightly faster was the one I mentioned below on the slide where you do PME, the non bonded, the dihedrals, and the angles every four femtoseconds. So that would be about equivalent in performance to virtual sites or slightly faster. But that turns out to be slightly unstable or, yeah, unstable very frequently. So that's the equivalent. P PME only is a much smaller gain, as I answered before. That's yeah, 10, I just, I, 10, just, okay, just, 10, just that, so. you, that you get around the communication bottleneck uh, in highly, highly parallel yeah. simulations, I would. Think. Well, you 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 also you also do 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 much less PME, so especially on, on a GPU PME can be expensive. So um, there's there are some gain to be had there, which can be quite a lot actually. So, um, but it's not it's not it's not the factor. Of what do we get with virtual sites? Factor one point seven, one point eight or so. Mm -hmm. That's that's getting less and less on on GPUs. So that's one of the main reasons for 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 going to multiple time setting is because that works better on GPUs in principle. Okay. But then we need yeah, to find a good. Then we, then we need to find a good scheme that gives you m more ben be more benefit than only PME, uh, only transferring PME. But I don't know if there is such a scheme yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. The next question we have is from Luca Monticelli. Again, a multiple time stepping question. Uh, does it have any effect on energy conservation? I imagine that in the cases where it crashes, then yes, definitely, and presumably well, the others. No, it's 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 a symplectic algorithm as I as I wrote. So it's it's it, it preserves energy extremely well. So it uh, it's you don't see anything in energy conservation in practice, uh, even for the things that might crash quite quickly. So I would say often it it preserves energy really good. So of course, if you do things really bad, you might see something. But uh, um, no, so it's, it's since it's impacting and you're acting on slow on slow degrees of freedom, it it, it usually pr preserves energy as well as as uh, not using it. That makes sense. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from uh, James Caruthers. Uh, how does the performance and precision of the AWH model uh, for free energy calculations compare to standard parallel simulations or or expanded ensembles? I imagine of rather than or there. But. So if the question about precision, I mean that's that's a matter of how how long you run your simulation. So any proper algorithm or method should converge as close as you want to the to the to the exact answer by running longer. So that's also the case for AWH as it is for all the other methods. So you should you can get as accurate as you would like to be by running longer. And the only question is what which method is more efficient. So the only exception from that is, is is free energy integration, where you have quadrature errors, which don't go away if you simulate longer. But um, methods like BAR, normal expanded ensemble, and AWH, they convert to the exact answer if you have enough, if you, as long as you throw more and more sampling in. So there's a question of which method is more efficient, which is a, a difficult question in general, and might depend on the system. 
Thank you very much for that answer. And uh, our... the question, sorry, the question includes also performance. Yeah, so performance, as I said, it depends on the system. So we are we're we're working on a manuscript, and there it seems like it's 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 uh, as good as bar or slightly better. But that's of course only for the few systems we tried. So that's not a conclusive answer, but it seems it seems to be at least as good as as bar. So that's what I can say for standard free energy calculations, alchemical calculations. Great, thank you very much. And our final question is from Yasser Almeida. Uh, Yasser asks, have you considered to include the installation of Python API directly during the building of Gromax? Currently, this is done as a second step after you've built Gromax. Uh, you can install the Python API directly with your Gromax build. You need to set, I think it's Python package, minus the Python package on, if I remember the uh, CMake magic for this exact, yes, this was the CMake magic. It should also be documented somewhere in the GMAX API installation documents, but maybe it's a bit hidden and we should make it more prominent. But yeah, you can install the Python API that is shipped with your Gromax build this way directly. Great, thank you very much. And we have thanks from Yasser. And uh, there's actually been a final, final question that's uh, made it in uh, from Mandar Kulk uh, Kulkarni. The question is, uh, can we use the RESPA algorithm? Uh, I imagine the multiple time step RESPA algorithm, but that's not specified. Can we use the RESPA algorithm with metadynamics? That I can't answer conclusively, because I don't know how metadynamics is coupled to Gromax. That's not something we do. That's something that the, the Plume team does. So I don't see any fundamental issues there, but I can't, I don't dare to answer that. Great, thank you very much for that answer. And with that, that concludes uh, the questions that have been asked. Um, thank you again, uh, Burke and Paul, for uh, taking the time to talk us through all of the new features of Gromax 2021 and uh, giving us an update on the state of Gromax now and in the near future. Uh, and thank you everyone for uh, coming to this webinar. I hope you all have a day.